So while, while the slide comes up, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for my invitation. And uh, I'd like to emphasize how impressed I am by the, the previous talks. This sort of very careful look at all the dynamics is a really important thing. In, in this case, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm really standing back from uh, those processes and simplifying them and coming up with a very, very simple uh, simulation of the, of the termination, looking directly at sea level. So I want to flag up the uh, latest pages news that I edited along with uh, Bill Thompson, Claire Welbrook, and Louise Newman. Uh, we uh, asked, asked for contributions uh, for new ways of looking at sea level, and in an integrated way, so uh, looking at uh, recent observations of ice sheets, ice sheet modelers, uh, and sea level, sea level reconstruction, as well as isostatic effects. So bringing together those communities, I think there's a, a lot of progress that we can make together. So this is uh, the title of my talk, Scaling Future Sea Level Change, Lessons from the Termination. This is work that I've done with uh, Thomas Stocker and Peter Clark. As soon as you talk about using paleo records, particularly from the quaternary, to look at the future, people say, well, you know, there's no analog, there's a big ice sheet there. And so the key thing is, it's, I mean, it, there is a direct continuum from the, through the termination, through the Holocene, to the future. Uh, so it's not as if this problem is necessarily discontinuous. The question is then, how do we scale uh, effects which happen during the period of higher ice volume into the future? What are, what are the scalings that we might use? So I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, the IPCC, as has been emphasized in the previous talks, they essentially said we don't understand the full dynamics of ice sheet adjustments to temperature change and that these changes are highly complex. So that's a difficult starting position. I mean, you've got options. You can really push uh, better understanding of the dynamics, and this is certainly something which is going on in the, the race to the next IPCC uh, report. And also, perhaps you can stand back a bit and take the approach that Fortunat Yos mentioned, which is to make as few assumptions as possible, to come up with as simple a model as possible with as few parameters as possible to, to see if you, you know, to work out the PDF for future change. So that's the question. Can we use paleo sea level records of the last termination to scale sea level rise over the next century? And that's what I'm going to try and do. Uh, we've not necessarily been 100% successful, but we've tried uh, this approach. So Stefan Ramsdorf uh, suggested this very, very simple uh, response model. I mean, it's, a, it's just a very simple um, response to the temperature change here. If you have a st here is the illustration is the step temperature change, and then the sea level responds with some adjustment time scale. And if the temperature change is larger, the adjustment time, the adjustment will be faster but following this similar time scale. So the magnitude of the sea level adjustment over time, this slope, uh, is proportional to the temperature change. Now one of the things which is different between what Stefan did looking, he looked at the last century's change, uh, one of the things that's very different for us is we cannot assume that this temperature change and this sea level change are constant. So we, we need a, a change in the relationship between uh, the temperature change and the sea level change if we're going to look into the glacial period. Actually, I suspect for temperature changes as large as the upper limit of what Stefan looked at, six degrees, it might not be fair to consider uh, their direct linear relationship between delta T and uh, delta H here. So Stefan's model, you can sum it up simply by saying that the rate of change in sea level here is a function of how far you are from an equilibrium sea level at your present temperature. So this equilibrium at the present time, so this equilibrium sea level is a function of the temperature that you're at, and the rate of change is a function of how far you are from it. Now Stefan, just simply really what he assumed is that this it is a linear function of temperature. The sea, sea level equilibrium is a linear function of temperature. So that is not something you can assume over the glacial cycle. So the change in sea level is found by integrating this 
and uh, that's what we're going to do. So the thing is about using the last century is that you're looking at changes in temperature of up to six degrees, and that parallels the change in temperature, the global mean change in temperature since the LGM. So you really can't assume that uh, the response is going to be uh, as simple as you might learn from the last century, particularly when the records of the last century are short um, and the magnitude of temperature change is very small compared to what's projected for the next century. And if you allow for the fact that the ice sheet response will respond to the integrated increase in temperature over several centuries, if not millennia, uh, it's pretty difficult to use uh, a century-long record. So I think this speaks to use the uh, termination record for this purpose. So what do we need? We need temperature data. Uh, we need sea level data. We need some additional term to, to explain equilibrium sea level and some asymmetry term because during the termination there are periods of relative cold, relative warm. So we're going to need to think about uh, periods when the ice sheets might have regrown slightly or at least uh, slowed down their loss. So the temperature records we're going to use, one of the problems, problematic things about using the termination is the strong polar asymmetry which we're all familiar with. We've discussed it all the way through many of the ice core talks uh, yesterday. So I'm going to use two scenarios. I'm going to use the Epica uh, deuterium temperature record to force the termination, and I'm going to use the North Grip uh, temperature record to force the termination. And I'm going to use the fossil, coral re uh, fossil uh, sea level reconstructions here, which include fossil and uh, other sea level indicators. So, uh, what's this additional term for equilibrium sea level? We've crossed off the temperature data and sea level data. Uh, what is this additional term? So really what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at the assumption that as you move into the interglacial periods, uh, there's less and less uh, vulnerable ice. The vulnerable ice really in the quaternary interglacials would include uh, Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets. So much less vulnerable ice than uh, when the Laurentide has grown, and into the glacial period, there'll be uh, feedbacks uh, such as the um, height effect, which in, in the end give the elevation desert effect and mean that it re becomes relatively hard to continue to grow the ice sheet to their maximum extent. So really, I'm imagining the situation where the quaternary uh, glacial maxima and minima are relatively similar to each other, and I'm assuming that that's because there's a relative lower sensitivity of the ice sheets to temperature and climate change during those periods with a relatively rapid transition in between, so a relatively sensitive period in between. So that's the actual function, and if you can't imagine inverse uh, hyperbolic shine functions in your head, uh, I'll show you what they look like. Um, so here are the two scenarios. Um, the thick line and the cloud in each color uh, map here, so the North Grip is red, Epicodome C is blue, uh, represent the optimum best fit for the model. So I'm actually tuning this curve. I'm forcing it to pass through the Holocene. Uh, actually, so it passes through a point in the Holocene. This is zero, zero, really. All my temperature is what I define as delta T prime. So that's the change relative to the Holocene normalized by the LGM to modern uh, difference. So I just take the difference to the Holocene and divide by the LGM to uh, Holocene difference. I force it to go through the last interglacial. This is just really, it's a, it's a proxy for the change in sensitivity uh, into warmer temperatures. Uh, the last interglacial was not exactly the same as the Holocene, there was different insulation forcing, but a, a paper we've had recently uh, in Nature Geosciences with Elka Rowling looking at the Red Sea, uh, sea level re relationship with temperature um, is indicating that really it's temper which, temperature which is the key driver for the specific sea level here. So I'm reasonably comfortable with this. But we're really trying to get a handle on this change in sensitivity. So it's interesting to note that independently then, because I, it's forced to go through the LGM, Holocene and LIG, 
These other um, sea level indicators are just uh, to illustrate that we're going through the right parameter space. Uh, the North Grip scenario independently comes through stage three. The Epicodome C1 uh, doesn't. So uh, I won't go through these uh, now. This is just to indicate where we got the data for that plot, and I can discuss that later with people if they'd like. So finally, then, this asymmetry term, uh, because we're expecting growth, to be, uh, growth of ice sheets to be somewhat slower than the loss of ice sheets. It turns out to be about a factor of two um, that's needed. So this means that when we integrate uh, this um, equation, we can't uh, just simply solve it because we need to allow for the fact that this is going to change direction. It changes depending on whether uh, you're lower than equilibrium sea level or higher than equilibrium sea level, so that you uh, reduce the rate of um, sea level change according to whether ice sheets are generally growing or, or being lost. So we've got all of these um, aspects now. We can start to look at the sensitivity of the variables. We have the time constant tau. We have the slope of the equilibrium sea level. So that really decides uh, whether you've got a step function or a, a linear fit and anything in between. Uh, the midpoint of the transition, which de decides where the steepest part of the shine function is, and this asymmetry term. And really, as it turns out, uh, the key sensitivities are this slope and the time constant. There's very little sensitivity to these other parameters. So it, essentially, uh, we're, we've got two free parameters. The others are very tightly constrained. So what's the model sensitivity then to changing the variables which control the equilibrium sea level function? So that's what I'm looking at here. Here's varying the midpoint of the equilibrium sea level function. So you see here, the dashed line moves the midpoint to warmer temperatures. And here is the measure of uh, the fit We're using R squared against the uh, data set. So as I move the midpoint of the um, equilibrium sea level function, I move this, uh, the response against sea level, the time dependent response against sea level to warmer temperatures and I lose the strong fit against data that I get for the optimum. As I change the slope of the equilibrium sea level function, I move between a linear function here in the dashed line and a, uh, almost a step function in the um, full line here. As you see that you really need to allow for the change in sensitivity of the ice sheet response. Here is just the linear function, which is, uh, you know, of course, the, one of the first reviewers' comments on this was, why don't you just use a linear function? Why, why introduce this complication? Uh, well, you know, you really can't get away with that. Uh, as you get more steppy, then everything just turns out to be too abrupt and you don't pick up the subtlety. Uh, through the termination. And then what about these, uh, the variables controlling rate? So that would be tau and this asymmetry function. So tau, it's a bit of a no-brainer, really. Uh, for a very short tau, the um, response is too fast, and you're, uh, you've got sea level too high during the termination. And for very long values of tau, uh, everything's too slow, and you move to uh, missing out the start of the Holocene, for example. Uh, there's a reasonable, there's a good sensitivity to tau, but R squared does, I mean, it doesn't really matter. This is, I, in the end, you only need to, I only included R squared for completeness uh, because I knew that this would be uh, something that people were concerned about. So we included this variable, but uh, it makes almost no difference whether I include it or not, whether it's one or um, a very low value, it, because the only period of significant regrowth of ice is during the Younger Dryas and, at the, and during Heinrich 1 here at the start of the termination. So as I said, there's only two really important variables that we're tuning to. So what do the simulations of the termination look like? So thanks. again, using the same color scheme, uh, here in red at the top, this is the non-linear scale for the equilibrium sensitivity curves. These are the fine lines. Here you can see that the Younger Dryas is actually slightly extended here compared to the straightforward record. Also the period of Heinrich 1, there's more sensitivity. You see that the optimum fit. What I've done here, this cloud of data is from a Monte Carlo simulation where I varied 
the estimate for LGM sea level, um, and also I subsample the data evenly through the record to allow for the fact that there's too much. There's a lot of data density in the Holocene compared to previous periods in the record. So you end up with this cloud of uh, simulations with the best fit simulation in the thick red line. Now you see that the North Grip simulation maps all the way through the termination very nicely. The bowling occurs just as this rise in sea level is occurring here throughout, throughout the bowling. So the melt water pulse is somewhere down here and then the continued response to the warming is, is here all the way through the bowling. You just can't get that using the uh, southern hemisphere forcing. Uh, the response is always too uh, late. Uh, you don't capture this, uh, these changes during the bowling and you don't capture the post younger dryas rise. So really there's no way to explain the rise using the southern hemisphere forcing so we're using the northern hemisphere for the rest of these simulations. Here's the Laurentide ice sheet uh, data. Uh, this is a plot that Peter put together and it's got the Dyke et al. Um, Laurentide area reconstruction plotted against sea level just to show that the Laurentide ice sheet area uh, gives the same, the same story, the same general story. What about the time constant? Is the uh, time constant a function of where you are in the glacial period? Is that a function of temperature? Can you expect faster responses in the interglacial periods? What I've done here, each of these color bars represents the period that I've tuned the model to in the upper uh, plot. Of course, I can't tune the equilibrium sea level curve here. This is just tuning the time response. So here I've just time tuned it to this window of data. In blue, I've tuned it to this window of data. So you can pick that up because each the orange curve really is a very close fit to the data through that period. The blue is a close fit to data through here, green through here. So I've looked at very different windows during the termination. The time scale of response just changes by a couple of hundred years. So there's very little sensitivity about where I tune the model time scale response. So the, time, the response time scale of the ice sheets is constant. What about the last century? Well, this is really beginning to push it. There are important centennial scale changes during the termination, but not decadal scale changes. So this is how I interpret this uh, change to the last glacial period. You can see we pick up the centennial trend very well with this uh, large uncertainty cloud. Here's the uh, residuals. Uh, so you can see we, we pick up the centennial trend, but we definitely don't pick up these decadal changes. That's the long time scale of response that, that you get for the integrated sea level response. So this is the sea level response of all the different components of sea level, thermal expansion, ice sheets, glaciers. So the, these decadal changes we're not picking up, but I think on the decadal level, we're, uh, we're doing, sorry, the centennial level, we're on relatively safe ground. So finally then, this is the uh, projection for the future, just to emphasize that the rate through the rate of sea level rise through the Holocene is in agreement with other estimates. This is the IPCC estimate for a rise during the last century. And to, to emphasize as well, the reason that we're making reasonably tight projections is it's mainly because I'm zeroing this at the year 2000. I'm interested in the rate of change that the model tells me rather than the um, absolute value. So if I didn't zero the model here, we'd get a very wide uh, uncertainty range for the next century. Uh, but by zeroing it, I bring the uncertainty to a reasonable level. Uh, the uncertainty obviously opens up very widely by the end of the century. Here are the IPCC projections, and, you, and this, these light bands at the top are the IPCC projections with a simple scaling that they carried out to try and get some sort of handle on the dynamic uh, part of the ice sheets, which isn't explicitly in the sophisticated ice sheet models that they used. So you see that we get a large overlap, really, between our uh, model through the termination and the IPCC projections. Uh, we, they're getting up to 0.76 meters, we get up to 0.82 meters. Our uncertainty bars are wider than theirs. I think that's a, <laughs> that would be what you expected uh, from trying to use this um, data through the termination. The major reason, if I, if I make the same assumption as Stefan that the sensitivity is linear um, as a function of temperature, then we'd get that number. 
the major reason that this number comes down is assuming that the sensitivity uh, of the sea level response to temperature uh, reduces for higher sea level. Dynamically, that's things like the loss of the marine margins on Greenland mean that there's a fast response and that slows down uh, with higher temperature. Okay, so to sum up then, the paleo sea level data I think has great potential to teach us about future sea level rise and the integrated response of ice sheets to climate change. As we move into the second or third century of anthropogenic perturbations, that means, you know, to understand the sea level response, you'd really like two, three, four centuries of sea level change to understand that on the right time scale for the perturbation. So that really brings uh, paleo sea level, particularly during the termination, where there are several important steps in sea level on centennial time scales. Here we've suggested how you might scale that change. And just to say we're impressed with this and uh, we'll get there at the end of this month. Uh, thanks very much.